I would like to thank the members of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority and Delta Sigma Theta for serving as ushers for this evening's program. I'd like to thank you for attending tonight and encourage you to attend our upcoming programs. First, we have a Purdue Alumni Speaker Series, which will feature Dr. Johnny Early, Dean of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Studies at Florida A&M University. His topic for his presentation will be, Let Your Difference Make a Difference. His presentation will be held on Thursday evening, October the 18th at 8 p.m. in Stewart Center, room 212. The second in our series of programs will be the Black Cultural Center's Coffee House number 29. It will be October the 26th at 8 p.m. in the BCC Multipurpose Room, and it will feature the Haraka Writers in Zoom Live Jazz. I also would like to encourage you to purchase a BCC 20th Anniversary T-shirt for the cost of $5. We are selling the T-shirts both at the Black Cultural Center and follow immediately following tonight's program. Ms. Janice Sykes, a senior from Maywood, Illinois, will be introducing our speaker for this evening. Janice is majoring in communications with an emphasis in film production. She is on the BCC staff as student coordinator of the New Directional Players, and she is also an executive board member of SLAM, the Society of Liberal Arts for Minorities, and is also a member of the NAACP and Association for Black Students. Janice is a very talented student playwright and actress. She recently wrote, directed, and performed in an original production which was featured at our Black Coffee House on September the 28th. I present to you Ms. Janice Sykes. Thank you. Following Mr. Davis's presentation, there will be a question and answer period. And followed by, following that, there will be a reception in the Purdue Memorial Union West Faculty Lounge. For over three decades, Ozzie Davis has held a unique place among the great artists of American theater, equally distinguished as an actor, writer, and director. Mr. Davis made his Broadway debut in Jeb and has appeared in such noted plays as Pearly Victoria, of which he was the author and the star, A Raisin in the Sun, and he starred in the 1986 Tony Award winning production of I'm Not Rappaport. Mr. Davis has appeared in several motion pictures, among them his own Pearly Victorious and the critically acclaimed Spike Lee movie Do the Right Thing in which he played the mayor. In addition, Ozzie Davis has directed several well-known motion pictures, among them Cotton Comes to Harlem and Black Girl. For television, Mr. Davis and his wife, actress Ruby D, co-hosted and co-produced three seasons of the critically acclaimed PBS series with Ozzy and Ruby, and other television roles were in Roots, The Next Generation, and King, for which he won an Emmy nomination. Besides Pearly Victorious, other published works by Ozzy Davis include Langston, a play based on the life of Langston Hughes, and Escape to Freedom, a play about the life of young Frederick Douglass. Now it is my overwhelming pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Ozzy Davis. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Thank you, my fellow students. You needn't applaud so vociferously. Your marks will be determined by how I'm feeling when I mark you. How are you? How's everybody? Well, first, I'd just like to say happy birthday to the Black Cultural Center, 20 years old and counting. I think it's marvelous. I'm happy to have been invited to come and share in the birthday celebration of this institution. I have been wined and dined and made to feel at home in such an extraordinary way that I'm sure I'm gonna find it difficult to get up in the morning and catch the plane out. I'll probably be crying all the way to the airport. Uh, Mr. Zamora, who is an old and dear friend, has proven to be uh, an instructor who shares with me uh, what he loves uh, about the university, about the center, about the people in it. I went to the center, I looked at everything, I saw everything, I shook hands with the students, I talked, I looked at the books, I talked to some of the books. I had a lovely time. I looked at the pictures on the wall and they communicated with me readily. I had no problems whatsoever. I am, as I said before, happy 
to be here. Uh, sometimes uh, when I travel, uh, I'm traveling uh, as a part of a twin, uh, as a part of a pair. Uh, Ruby D and I have been on the hustings about 30 years, but there are occasions where we show up uh, one without the other. And the truth of the matter is, each of us is quite capable of, you know, gow you know gorging up a full evening entertainment. So don't don't feel that you are uh, being mistreated because Ruby is working with Spike Lee and I am here working with you. There'll be another time when the whole situation will be reversed and uh, she'll be here with you and I'll be stuck with Spike Lee. <laughs> now, which is not a bad, you know, stuck as, as to tell the truth of it. Black cultural centers, what are they? Where do they come from? What purpose do they serve? Uh, on first glance, you, you might say that uh, black cultural centers have gotten together, uh, you know, to make the black students feel comfortable and the white people uncomfortable. No, that's not really what it's all about at all. There is far more fundamental something at work here that has to do not only with black people and their culture, but America and uh, America as a place where all cultures uh, presumably have a chance to light their own light and show what it is that they are most proud of. But black cultural centers uh, are a relatively new phenomenon on the scene. Uh, this one is 20 years old. Uh, very few of them really are older than that. Uh, they came into prominence uh, at the end of and as the result of uh, the, you know, the revolution of the 60s and the 70s, which started uh, over questions of education and which ended with uh, our institutions of learning being mandated to open their doors to the inclusion of all Americans who wanted to come study regardless of their race, color, uh, gender, or creed. And uh, it was found that in order to satisfy some of the needs of the newcomers, uh, new things had to be put on the menu, uh, courses that dealt specifically, in this instance, with black people, who they were, their culture, their song, their dance, and the meaning of it all. Uh, the educational institutions opened their doors, if not their hearts, uh, because in addition you know, to uh, having to fulfill the mandate of good liberal consciences, uh, the government said, if you don't open your doors, we ain't going to give you any more money, and that was very persuasive. Uh, the doors were open and black youngsters did come in and began to find their way into the university. Uh, but was there a need for black cultural centers uh, on the campuses then? Is there a need now? Isn't education one thing? Aren't we dealing with truth? Doesn't two plus two equal four wherever the situation, I mean, wherever you're coming from? Uh, uh, we are teaching Americans here. We are teaching literature, we're teaching what the truth is all about. Uh, why should there be any particular cultural reference, any particular bent in one particular uh, uh, area? Doesn't that really distort the whole process? Aren't the universities engaged in the universal pursuit of knowledge uh, and opening their doors means everybody comes in and fills up his cup and goes back out into the, to the world? Well, the truth of the matter, uh, matter is it doesn't quite work that way, nor should it. Education is about more than the results of two plus two. It is about much more than that. And uh, that's one of the motives behind establishing places like the Black Cultural Center. Uh, let me, before I do some sharing with you of some of the glories and goodies of uh, uh, black culture, which is what I really uh, came to do, uh, let me put into some kind of perspective uh, what the Black Cultural Center is all about, how it relates to our history, not only the history of education, but black people in general in America, et cetera. Now, I warn you in advance, I'm not a scholar. Uh, fairly good student, but not a scholar. I'm not an authority. I'm not a teacher. I am a storyteller, which means I can tell you what I feel out of my heart that makes a good story. Now, uh, after you hear what I say, and you go back to your instructor and ask him, uh, did you hear what Asi said? And the instructor says, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all a lie, but it did sound good, didn't it? Um, that's perfectly within my purview. You know, I'm not here to convert you or to convince you. I'm merely here to share with you my feelings 
about the life I have lived, the books I have read, the people I have met, the races I have won, most of which I lost, but to just open myself up to you and if there's something in what I am that you want or need or can make use of, feel free. Now, let us go into Ossie's version of history and how black folks fitted into it. Uh, a long time ago, we were Africans on the mother continent and uh, we were the in we were the inheritors of beautiful, rich uh, civilizations and cultures and literatures and various things like that. In those days, of course, this was, we were pre-literary. This was before uh, mankind in general, and Africa in particular, had started putting the great glories of their culture in written form. It was oral, and to this day, we speak of black folks as having a very strong oral tradition. And uh, the oral tradition uh, came with us, and it, it persists. And tonight, I'd like to practice a little bit of it, even as I stand before you now. So this is not really a lecture. It's not totally a performance. It's an exercise in storytelling. So you have to keep your eye open when the story uh, is being told, because the storyteller is always a trickster, you know, and you have to check his facts and all that stuff. Uh, but if you, you can go along with him, sometimes <laughs> the moral or the punchline makes the whole adventure uh, worthwhile. Um, that was a long time ago when we were in Africa, uh, the beneficiaries of great oral traditions. And then about four years ago, 400, no, 400 years ago, when we were invited to come over to America and partic participate in the great democratic tradition and uh, experiment, really, uh, we brought with us uh, certain habits, uh, certain now, it is true that we were denuded of our language, of our identity, of our cultural heritage, our tribal identity, and all of that sort of thing. But uh, some of the things that we had in Africa, we managed to hang on to. And one of those things was storytelling. And the great storytellers uh, came with us into the slave camps and stayed with us while we were slaves. And they serve us even now. Jesse Jackson is a good example, a great storyteller. And uh, we need his stories. The, not only black folks, everybody does. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that I mean. But to tell you my story, my to storyteller's version of uh, life in America for black folks and how that led directly to black cultural senses such as the one we have now. Uh, consider the fact that uh, during the time of the revolution, there was a great ferment in the country. And what kind of country this was going to be was brooded about and talked about and fought over. And the question as to how black folks fit into the country at all was of major consideration. Uh, Mr. George Washington, in the very beginning, thought it would be better uh, to fight the whole American Revolution without any black folks at all. That would make the distinction between whites and blacks very clear. And he thought that would be, you know, the nice and bright thing to do. Uh, it was found early on that in a war you need all the hands you can get, whatever color they are. So George opened his heart and the, his military ranks and invited the blacks to come on in. Uh, the question as to their status, uh, you know, was, was brooded about, and the British were not kind. Uh, they said to any black who escaped and fought for the British would be given his freedom. Well, that was underhanded, as you can see right away, and the slave masters had to come up with their own ploy. Well, don't go to the British. Stay here and fight with us, and we'll see what we can do. We can't just make you free, but we'll think about it very strenuously. After the war was over, and blacks to some 5,000 uh, had participated in fighting what they thought was their own liberation. The question of who the hell they, these black folks were and what we're going to do about them came to a head in 1787 in Philadelphia when the founding fathers found themselves arguing over black folks in Philadelphia. The Constitution had to be, you know, uh, organized. The, the document which was going to run the country was being put together. And it almost came to nothing because the question of slavery and black folks and what they meant you know, separated the brothers pretty deeply. They came up with a compromise, but the compromise was an evasion. And America learned early on the habit of evasion. Probably they learned it from the Constitution. And to this very day, we practice evasion. I, the last war that we ever had was one I fought in called World War II. Uh, the Korean police action, the Vietnam uh, police action, uh, the Panama, rescue or uh, whatever we did in Grenada. These were not wars at all. These, these, this was police action. Our great talent for evasion has served us well. 
and may well account for where we are today with our tremendous military might and power. Now, we in the black community were deeply concerned about what was going to happen. We had fought and, you know, we thought perhaps the time had come for us to be American citizens too. Uh, however white folks felt, we didn't like slavery. We, we really objected very strongly to it. And, uh, it, it, you know, even the cost of being an American was a bit high if you had to come here in, in chains. And we figured that, you know, we, we didn't like that so much. And we watched with great trepidation what was happening in uh, Philadelphia as Ben Franklin and Tom Jefferson and Adams and the Randolph brothers and all the Rutledges who argued and fought and, 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 and wheeled and deal and evaded and avoided. Uh, now, it so happens in 1787, another incident related to that same uh, uh, struggle was going on on another side of town. And it had to do particularly with the status of black people in the religious establishment in, in America. Um, there was a great preacher whose name was Richard Allen. He's a black man. Uh, he was born a slave and uh, uh, eventually joined the church, got to be a preacher, and uh, could, he preached so hard he converted his master. You know, and he, he bought himself free and he became a minister. He was a Methodist. He attended the first founding convention of the Methodists had in America in Baltimore. And he was deeply pleased when at that convention the Methodists said, slavery is a sin. Anybody who owns slaves cannot even be a member of the connection. Oh, Richard Allen, when he heard that, said, oh man, yeah, this is for me. And he became all the more Methodist because he felt that that was the way to go. And uh, he was, as I said, a sort of a preacher going around with the other preachers and helping them out. Uh, they led him into Philadelphia because there was a big church there, St. George's uh, Methodist Church, which had, what really hadn't been filled. And Philadelphia at that time was the stopping off place for all the people who escaped from the South. All the slaves heading north wound up in Philadelphia. And they were cold and they were poor and they were hungry. They were just like immigrants and had nothing and they were dirty and they were filthy and they were unemployed and they were sick and they were hungry and they were miserable and they needed some kind of solace. Well, Richard Allen thought that the Methodist church was just the place for these black folks. In the first place, when Richard came to the Methodist church, they didn't even have many buildings. People used to have meetings out in the field, you know, uh, under the trees, and there would be Indians there and black folks there and Irish people there, and they would be praising the Lord like all hell, you know, and Richard liked that very much. Now, in Philadelphia, when they started to build the church, uh, th there were some black folks there, and they brought in Richard to preach to the black folks. And uh, they would let him preach, say, 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but there weren't many black folks in that church. Uh, they, they, they were not treated well, and, and they, they weren't really happy with the treatment, so they began to stay away in droves. Now, when Richard came, he said, no, that's not right. This is the church, brothers. We need you in here. So he went among the slaves and said, look, 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 look. i tell you what we do. Why don't we help St. George's complete the building? I, I, I don't want your money because I know you ain't got none but I got some hammers, I got some nails, and you brothers know how to saw and you know how to put things together. And the black folks got together and helped St. George build that magnificent edifice and they were sort of welcomed in. But once they got in, all was not peaches and cream. Uh, Richard was still preaching at five o'clock in the morning, uh, but they decided to you know, bring everybody down into the, you know, into the church and they would have services. Now, to the blacks, religion was a, a question of great urgence. They wanted right away to talk to God as soon as they could get a hold of God and tell him, God, you don't know what is happening down there in the South. God, have you, did you know? I, look, I got, please, God, I got some urgent things I want to say. Mom is still down there, my children. God, uh, could you listen to me, please? Well, that's what they were saying and thinking and singing and praying, and they're part of the church. On the other side sat the whites who were calm, and you know how white folks are, very well organized, very clean, and slaveholders and all sitting there wanting to hear the gospel and the singing at its best, the European style, you know. So when a, a hymn was raised, there would be two kinds of response to the hymn going on in the same church. On one side, all was polite, all was quiet, all was dignified, all approached God as he should be approached. Now put your hat off, dear God. On the other side, hey, God, for God's sakes, God, do something. Please, oh, Lord, that, 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 that,
So the people said, oh, Jesus. Uh, so finally, 1787 Philadelphia, finally the, 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 the church father said, this, this is too much. Uh, take them upstairs in the balcony. Uh, well, Richard Allen uh, was a little disturbed by that. In the first place, uh, the church laws had, had begun to change since they had met in Baltimore and George Washington who had promised Lafayette that he was going to release all his slaves, had gone back on the promise. And George was a big church man. And there were slaveholders sitting in the congregation who weren't about to give up their slaves. So Richard himself was not quite comfortable with the situation. What had happened to the Methodist commitment to democratic procedure and the abolition of slavery? Little by little, it was sort of going by the way. But he was a good church man. He believed in the authority of the church. He believed that God was there and that God would make things right. So he did leave his congregation up into the balcony, he and the fellow named Absalom Jones. But even up in the balcony, the slaves were closer to heaven, so they got louder. <laughs> and man, they, oh God, you know, the, you, you know how black folks sing. You, you heard some of these gospel singers? Nothing, but, but these cats ain't nothing today to what the brothers were putting down then because slavery was still on them and the claws and the, you know, the scars were on their behinds and they really had, they sang and they shouted. The balcony started rocking like, you know, things. So the people got really disturbed about that. One Sunday morning when the prayer was called and, 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 and black folks don't, some of them play, pray quietly, but in the black community, prayers and active wrestling with God. You know what I mean? God got to hear you, and you got to get your message in there quick, because all the other deacons are trying to get theirs in there too. So, uh, while the prayer was going on downstairs, upstairs, man, they were moaning and go, "Oh, Father, once more in our church, we come before your throne, and we, and we petition you." And uh, Richard Allen was on his knees praying, leading his congregation. And the white usher came upstairs and <laughs> said, oh, no, no. So he went to Richard and said, hey, come, get up, up. So what? Up off your knees. No, this, you got, y'all got to cut this out. Alan said, I'm praying. He said, I don't care what you're doing, man, but up, up, up. Alan said, hold it, hold it. You ain't going to get me up off my knees while I'm talking to God. I'm going to finish this prayer. But after I finish this prayer, then maybe you won't have any more problems. So finally, Richard finished the prayer. Everybody said, Amen. Richard got up, collected his congregation, came downstairs, marched out of the Methodist church in 1787, and aiming back yet. Now, what happened? Richard went and, this, with the help of uh, others, founded a, BAP, uh, a black church that was still Methodist, but it was by itself. Now, the Methodist church connections said, now, we own this church, although you built it with your own money. We're going to staff it with offices, and we're going to be in charge of it. Richard thought about it a long time. He didn't want to rebel against the church, but he knew that he couldn't let that happen. The black folks had built it with their pennies and their hammers, and, their, and it meant so much to them. It was their consolation, and inside of it, they could yell as loud as they wanted to. So Richard said, no, no, in this church, we're going to have black preachers, and we're going to have black deacons and black deaconesses and whatever. No, Methodists don't have deacons, whatever. So the big argument, the church says, you cannot tell us this church belongs to the connection, and we're going to tell you how to run it. Richard said, no, it belongs to the connection a little bit, but we're going to run it ourselves. And in our community, we need for our black children to see somebody black in authority. We need to hear the gospel coming from somebody black. We need to have somebody on our side who is talking directly to God. We can't have somebody else who don't even know who we are trying to tell God our problems. Y'all got to get, get, get out of the way. So the church sued to maintain the dominance of the property of the church, Big uh, Bethel Church, which is in Philadelphia right now. And Richard had to go to court. And with the help of friends, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, the courts ruled that the black folks could indeed control their church. That legal uh, opinion enabled the black folks to establish a separate black denomination, African Methodist Episcopal, which is going today. Now, the significance of this is very simply, Richard Allen, and he's only one, you know, this, this happened all over the country, had to make a decision. 
he had to make a decision which really said, if we're going to survive in America, we have got to segregate ourselves. We've got to pull ourselves together. We've got to build our institutions. We've got to teach our children. We've got to maintain our own ways. Because the world out there is more and more calling us niggers. If we accept their definition, we're dead. We have to have institutions where we can define who we are, where we can pool our little pennies, where we can build our schools and build our colleges and universities and control our culture, which is our definition. So it was Richard Allen, who was the father to some degree of black nationalism, who was the father of black people as an independent entity in American society. We deliberately segregated, withdrew ourselves from the larger body. And because we did that, we survived. Now, that was a dangerous thing to do because free blacks were always hated by the plantation owners who ran the government because they had a problem. How could they tell their black slaves that they're inferior and should work happily like mules when they could look up in Philadelphia and see free people with money and carriages and all free blacks? So there was an impulse to get rid of the free blacks in the country. As a matter of fact, there was a society for the colonization of Africa, which was not meant to colonize all the black folks down in the slave camps. No, 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 no. Just the free blacks, those who owned property, those who were self-sufficient, those who cared about the black folks in the South and wanted to do something about it, such as Richard Allen. And Richard Allen and his brothers were against those uh, uh, colonization societies because he understood what the political motive was. To remove an effective component of black power and black concern in black institutions to gut it and to send it offshore, leaving behind the masses of helpless poor folks in the slave camps. Uh, luckily, because of Richard Allen and others, we always fought that. And though some of us did go back to Africa uh, some of us even formed uh, Liberia, West Africa, where a lot of things are happening now on that theory. Most of us stayed in this country, but we stayed roughly to ourselves. We had our own segregated society. And because we had schools and churches, and the, ch and the schools were based on the churches, and we controlled the churches, we created our version of the Christian religion, which sustained those values which were important to us. And because we did, we maintained ourselves as a people. And out of that church came our black thought, black science, certainly black music, black dance, black art, a black sense of identity. The churches and the schools where we sent our children, ingrown, ghettoized, segregated, separated, still they served our basic needs. It was not heaven by any means, it was hell but it still was an area that we could control and say who we were and who we were not. Now, this segregated and separated state lasted until slavery was legally abolished uh, uh, after the Civil War. And for a while, the blacks in the South and in the North thought that they indeed were free and that being free meant that they were also equal, uh, not true. In America, it's possible to be free without being equal. Even to this day, some of the basic problems faced by the black community derive from the fact that we do not ourselves understand the difference. We believe that having gained our freedom with the Civil Rights Revolution, and we don't know what the hell is wrong, why aren't we happy? Why aren't we in the middle, in the thick of things? Well, brothers, it's because we are free indeed, but we ain't equal by a long shot. And until we are equal, we're going to still be upset and disturbed and, and, and to some degree pathological in our responses. Well, the segregation that we imposed upon ourselves didn't mean that we wanted to sequester ourselves from, from white society. didn't mean that we felt we were better than white folks at all. It's just that we wanted to keep those things which were good and powerful for ourselves and to develop them for ourselves. Well, after the... The, the, the Civil War, and after 1876, when the Union withdrew the, the troops from the South and officially left the black folks at the mercy of the whites, 
uh, and the Ku Klux Klan and all that happened, uh, there was a move in Congress and the government uh, to establish legally a separate and segregated society. Uh, there was a Supreme Court decision in 1896 which said separate but equal is legal. Now, granted that a year before, a great black man in the South had almost paraphrased the phrase by accepting a compromise at the Atlanta Exposition, Mr. Booker T. Washington. I think Booker T. thought that being free was enough. If we weren't equal, we could still hold ourselves together and build our institutions and our stores and our churches and all and make our way through. Uh, W.B. Du Bois said, no, man. If you ain't going to fight for equality, your freedom is always limited, restricted, and ultimately going to take it from you. There was a big debate between those two, uh, which is still going on today, as a matter of fact. But the states began in the South to put on the books Jim Crow laws. And for the first time, the very first time in the country, it became legal and necessary that black folks practice segregation. Well, it's one thing to collect your forces and build yourself under your own aegis and for your own purposes. But to have it imposed upon you by law is something else altogether. Uh, besides, uh, we knew that we were in a polished state because we were not going to be treated like the other immigrants who came to this country. Uh, let's go back to 1845. Uh, in 1845, B potato famine in Ireland. A lot of people starving in Ireland. A lot of people left Ireland and came to America as immigrants in the Northeast. In 1845, in Philadelphia, black folks were in complete control of all the catering in the city. In 1845, in New York City, black folks had catering. Black folks were middle managers. Black folks were the new burgeoning middle class. Now, as I said before, they were free blacks. And those free blacks created, as I said, a, a problem for the South trying to keep their slaves contented. So it was decided when the time came for those black entrepreneurs to go to the bank and get their credit restored, the banks, little by little, cut off the credit of the black entrepreneurs and froze them out favoring the recently arrived immigrants. Not necessarily because the banks themselves hated black people, but because at that time, the government was in, in the control of the slave-holding South, and the South wanted to discommode the free blacks. So the South used its political and economic influence to undercut the economic necessities of the entrepreneurial class that we blacks had put up. And that was one of the first instances when we knew that we were in for a hard struggle before we ever would be ad admitted as an equal into the economy of America. Uh, when after World War, I mean after the Civil War, it was made legal. But the precedent had been established in 1845 with the arrival of the first wave of immigrants. So we found ourselves in the South after the Civil War, segregated and taking advantage of our segregation we did have our black institutions, we had our black church, we had our black colleges, we produced a black culture that was rich and thriving, we had a black economy, which was not a, a strong one, but it was a good one, and we, were, we could be black and comfortable and know who we were and define ourselves in that society. It was harassed, it was uh, attacked, the Ku Klux Klan kept us in, 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 uh, you know, off balance and killed us and all that, but it at least gave us that sense of togetherness. Now, we deliberately fought to end that state of segregation, not because we were foolish, not because we didn't appreciate what the black thing together would do for us, but we knew that on the question of equality, on the, which was decisive in American society, that as long as we accepted segregation, segregation was a way of accepting unequality and of society imposing the conditions of unequality on it. We knew. We'd have to pay dearly in terms of what happened to our institutions, our black schools, our black churches, and whatnot. But we willingly sacrificed in order 
to dismantle the barriers to equality in American society. And we lost a host of gifted black teachers, gifted black uh, instructors and college professors who in the rush to integration got phased out, left by the wayside. And we also sent our children newly freed from the black colleges and universities all over the country to enter whatever university they could get in. We knew this to be a right, and we knew that to preserve that right, we had to exercise it, and therefore we sent our children into the big uh, educational complexes where you find them today. And yet, the concern was, once they get there, what then? When they were at the black universities, when they were at Howard, when they were at Fisk, when they were at Morehouse, they were surrounded by blacks. They studied black culture as a matter of course. They saw black role models, black, 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 until they came out of their ears. But what when that same child went to another campus, a bigger campus, a colder campus, a whiter campus that had another agenda, like perhaps even here on Purdue? Could we just leave our students alone? Could we accept the myth that any child in America can become president if he works hard enough? Is rugged individualism a true description of what happens in America? And we found that if we thought that, we were, they, we, we were quickly disabused. Those children got on the campus. Nobody was waiting for them. Uh, nobody was particularly interested in what the hell happened to them. You know, it was sort of, oh, here it is. I got mine, now you get yours. See what you can do. And um, coming from schools which, to some degree, were inferior because they were underfunded, uh, where our students were not prepared coldly to compete with the other students, a lot of our students were lost by the wayside. And even those that had the capacity and those that had the gift lacked the motivation they didn't feel comfortable. They didn't feel welcome. They felt that they had left something but had gained nothing. We therefore had to find some way to follow our students onto those campuses, not to take them back, but to make available to them on those campuses, wherever they were, some of those values that we had worked so hard to achieve since Richard Allen had walked out and taught us the virtues of being among ourselves. And so little by little, we formed on the campuses black cultural centers, not to attack white cultural centers, not to pretend that we had something so precious that nobody else could touch it or understand it, and not to also say, we are, this is an invalid ward. We need the black cultural center because we didn't have it. We couldn't compete with you guys. None of that. The positive reason was that there is something in our culture that is precious, not only to us, but to the whole world, which if we lose, we lose the whole point of being black in the first place. And so black cultural centers came about. And in some instances, some places, they flourish. I think they flourish here on this campus. And I'm very pleased to come and celebrate this 20th anniversary of the establishment of this oasis, this island, this pool of self-sufficiency, which we blacks need so much, not only for our children and ourselves, but to show to all the world. And I dare say that those sons of mine, that one son out of four, who this day and this night languishes in prison or is a ward of the courts. If I had somehow found a way to give that son what is available in these black cultural centers, his, he wouldn't be there. And my heart wouldn't be so heavy as I stand and talk to you now. What we have here is valuable and vital but there is too little of it. And we do not know yet if it comes too late. A society that produces 
that number of individuals for which it has no need, economic or otherwise, is creating for itself a trap from which it may not yet emerge. We need to move and move quickly to make available to all people, whatever, the riches of our culture and their culture in a sense of restoration and resurrection and a sense of the interior definitions of what we must mean by manhood and womanhood in this society. Those few words were meant to give you a sketch of the exterior of what we mean by black culture. Let us now, with your indulgence, sample some of the interior goodies produced by that culture. A short while ago, we were talking about the situation in Africa, even before Tarzan got there, when we did produce rich literature, when the great scholars of Europe going down into Africa, listening, hearing the stories, the rich folk tales, and they themselves had come from Europe where the Grimm's brothers had told tales and all of those, and they heard these stories and they were amazed that these people, these people, these heathens could create such sophisticated literature. And a lot of them very wisely proclaimed they didn't really do it. Sometime in the past, somebody from Europe slipped down through the back door and told them all these stories. Of course, it wasn't true. We had created those stories ourselves. And as I said before, we brought them and the telling of them with us to this country. Let me read for you now, share with you now, uh, a Nigerian folk tale. And the reason I want to share this tale is because if you listen closely, if you know black literature and culture, you'll find that the creature, our hero here, is, is a twin to our own cultural hero in America. Here, it's called Ijapa, which is Yoruba for tortoise. Tortoise is, you know, a $10 word for turtle, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Over here, we call him rabbit. Bray rabbit, not Bugs Bunny. No, 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 please, 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 please. Bray rabbit, our hero, the man who taught us how to survive, who how to hit a straight lick with a crooked st a stick. You know, Mr. Be There, be there when they come, and be there when they go. You know, Br'er Rabbit, who says, throw me anywhere, but don't throw me in the briar patch. And of course, the briar patch was where he wanted to be all the time. If you listen closely, you will hear the ancestor of Br'er Rabbit inhabiting the body of this young turtle that I'm going to tell you about in this story called Ijapa and the Hot Water Test. Now, Ijapa, as I said before, this is from the Yoruba. Ijapa, uh, it is said that one time, Ijapa was called upon to come help harvest the chief's fields. The idea entrusted Ijapa because he had neglected to care for his own fields, which therefore had produced nothing, while the chief's fields were full of yams. Ejapa thought about how he might use the occasion to fill his empty storehouse. A plan came to him. In the night, he went to the chief's field and dug a hole. He made the opening small at the top, and he sprinkled grass and leaves around the hole to disguise it. Then he carried the dirt from the hole and threw it into the bush. Morning came. Ejapa went to the chief's house saying, O oh, chief, here I am. Apollo the frog was already there, as were Ekun the leopard, Ekute the bush rat, Ewure the goat, Agbornin the deer, and many others. They went out to the chief's field to dig yams. Now the other workers put the yams they dug into their baskets and carried them to the chief's storehouse. But Ijapa put a yam into his basket, then dropped a yam into the hole he had dug the night before. He put another yam into the basket and another into the hole. For each one he put into the basket, he put another one into the hole. Some of the other workers scolded Ijapa for being so slow, but Ijapa said, uh-uh. I have great respect for the chief's yams. I handle them gently. 
so as not to bruise them. The work went on. Soon the yams were harvested. The workers went home. And that night, when darkness came, Ijapa took his wife and children to the place where he had hidden the yams. They went back and forth many times, each carrying as many yams as he could until the hole was empty. Ijapa's storehouse was full. He was very proud. Oh, oh, oh. But when daylight came, the chief's servants found Ijapa's hole. They found the path his family had made while going back and forth. They followed the path to a Joppa storehouse and there they saw the yams. And they returned to report their findings to their chief. The chief sent for a Joppa. He spoke sternly. A Joppa, it is reported that you have taken yams from my field. A Joppa said, oh great chief, I came to help you with your great harvest. I labored in the hot sun. I brought yams to your storehouse. Now you reproach me. It is not I who has taken your yams. The chief said, Ijapa, your habits are widely known. And in addition, there is a path from my field to your storehouse. Ijapa said, oh, sir, I went to the field to work for you. I returned. Could this little walking have made a path? If there is such a path, it was made by others to discredit me. Were there not other persons in the field also? The chief said, yes, Ijapa, but there are no paths from my fields to their houses, only to yours. Therefore, suspicion falls on you. If you are innocent, we shall discover it. Let us prepare for the hot water test. Tomorrow, the people will assemble. We shall come to the truth of the matter. The water began to boil, the chief said, The Japa has been accused of stealing yams. He denies it. For this reason, he will take the test. He will drink a bowl of the boiling water. If he is guilty, he will feel great pain. If he is innocent, he will not be harmed. In this way, we will know the truth. Let us begin. The Japa spoke, saying, Oh, sir, Though I will be proved innocent, you still will not know who has taken your yams. The many persons here, let them also be tested. <laughs> the chief considered it. Finally, he said, this is good advice. Let everyone who was in the field also take the test. Ejapa now became very helpful, as if he were the chief's assistant. He ordered that the pot be removed from the fire. Place it here, he said, so that the chief may see it from where he sits. They moved the pot of water from the fire as the Japa directed. As I am the youngest, it is I who should serve the water to the others, the Japa said. The chief agreed. So the Japa took the bowl, filled it with hot water from the pot, and served it to Apollo the frog. The frog drank. It burned him inside. He cried out in pain. Japa filled the bowl again. He presented it to Equity, the bush rat. The water scalded his mouth. He cried out. Tears came to his eyes. Japa refilled the bowl and gave it to Ewuri, the goat. The goat cried. Japa gave hot water to Ekon, the leopard. The leopard moaned in pain, and tears flowed from his eyes. Each person drank. Each person suffered. And then it came to be Japa's turn. The chief said, all these persons have taken the test. All would seem to share the guilt. Now it is Ijapa's moment for guilt or innocence. Ijapa said, O oh, chief, I, Ijapa, am innocent. Yet I am the one who was accused. Therefore, I shall drink the largest portion of the hot water. In this way, I shall prove beyond doubt that I did not commit the crime. The bull is too small. Bring me a calabash. The chief sent for the largest calabash in the village. When it came, Ejapa filled it to the brim. He carried it to the chief, saying, See it, great chief. See how full the calabash is. The chief replied, I see it. You do well, Ejapa. Ejapa carried the calabash to the family of the chief. Family of the chief, 
See how full the calabash is. The family of the chief called out, We see it. You do well, Ijapa. Men of the village, Ijapa chanted, See how full the calabash is. The men all replied, We see it. You do well, Ijapa. Women of the village, See how full the calabash is. The women of the village all replied, We see it. You do well, Ijapa. Boys of the village, <laughs> girls of the village, see how full the calabash is. The boys and the girls all replied, we see it. You do well, Ijapa. Ijapa showed his calabash to this one and that one as evidence of the large amount of water he could drink. They could see that Ijapa was not shrinking from the ordeal. Meanwhile, the water in the calabash was getting cool. <laughs> At last, the chief said to Japa, we have declared ourselves enough. You do well. Now let us get on with it. So, a Japa drank. Because the water had become cool, it did not pain him. He emptied the calabash. The chief nodded his approval. A Japa said, you, you have seen it, all of you. I did not cry out. Tears did not come from my eyes. How then can I be guilty? And as an additional proof of his innocence, Ijapa jumped into the pot from which the water had come. The water in the pot was also cool. The chopper made sounds of pleasure as he splashed around. Oh, 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 oh. He was very pleased. Then he said, it was time to get out. And the chief said, no, Ijapa, don't leave the pot. Don't leave the pot. Don't leave the pot. I want my other wives to see how well you are doing. Make another fire under the pot. <laughs> another fire was built as the chief directed. His other wives came and took their places beside him. And soon the water began to get very warm. Chief, said Ijapa, wiping the sweat from his brow. May I come out now? The water is heating up, you know. Yes, Ijapa, but since you are not guilty, it cannot possibly harm you. Don't leave the pot. You do well, Ijapa. Don't leave the pot. The whole village agreed. No, Ijapa, don't leave the pot. Ijapa began to sweat even more. Soon, water began to steam and bubble until finally Ijapa jumped up and down and began to scream. I did it. I am guilty. It was I, Ijapa, who stole the yams. Let me out. Oh, chief, I beg you. This thing is burning me and boiling my feet too much. Oh, chief, I beg you, man. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out. The moral of the story is if you can't stand the hot, don't get in the pot. <laughs> A japa and the hot water test. Now, those stories, as I said before, were told over there. And we didn't tell the same stories over here. We told stories somewhat like them. And I'd like to do one that Zora Neale Hurston collected. But before I do it, I'd like to read something collected by a great scholar, a great authority who published this disquisition under the title, The English Language is My Enemy. Now, by R.C. Davis, of course. Uh, Marvelous piece of research. I'm sure that <laughs> soon, soon as the Pulitzer Prize people understand what I'm into, they're going to come running. Maybe the Nobel, but right now there's been a lot of silence on the subject. It doesn't matter. Let me share with you, my fellow authorities, what I have found in doing some basic and preliminary research. 
I read, I quote from myself. A superficial examination of Roger's thesaurus of the English language reveals the following facts. The word whiteness has 134 synonyms, of which 44 are favorable and pleasing to contemplate. That's, for example, purity, cleanness, immaculateness, bright, shining, ivory, fair, blonde, stainless, clean, clear, chaste, unblemished, unsullied, innocent, honorable, upright, just, straightforward, fair, genuine, trustworthy. Only 10 synonyms for whiteness appear to me to have negative implications, and these only in the mildest sense. Gloss over, whitewash, gray, wan, pale, ashen. The word blackness has 120 synonyms, 60 of which are distinctly unfavorable, and none of them, none of them even mildly positive. Among the offending 60 were such words as blot, blotch, smut, smudge, sully, begrime, soot, becloud, obscure, dingy, murky, low tone, threatening, frowning, foreboding, forbidden, sinister, baneful, dismal, thundery, evil, wicked, malignant, deadly, unclean, dirty, unwashed, foul. Not to mention 20 synonyms directly related to race, such as negro, negress, nigger, darky, blackamoor. When you consider the fact that thinking itself is subvocal speech, in other words, one must use words in order to think at all. When you consider that, you will appreciate the enormous heritage of racial prejudgment that lies in wait for any child born into the English language. Any teacher, good or bad, white or black, Jew or Gentile, who uses the English language as a medium of communication is forced willy-nilly to teach the black child 60 ways to despise himself and the white child 60 ways to aid and abet him in the crime. If my conclusions are correct, do we need any further proof of the benefits of black cultural centers? Now, but to get to, let's get a little to Zora Neale Hurston. But before I get to Zora Neale Hurston, one more digression. Uh, this is research done by somebody else, not me. But as a scholar, I respect other people's opinions. Now let me read a little from their research. In the Shakespeare Memorial Theater at Stratford-upon-Avon, there are 33 seats which bear bronze plates on which 33 great names are inscribed in memory of the greatest names in world drama. These are actors, Burbage, Garrick, the Kimballs, Kane, McCready, Forrest, Irving, and others. One of those chairs of honor bears the simple inscription, Ira Aldridge. Ira Aldridge one of the 33 greatest Shakespearean actors who ever lived, an American Negro born in New York City who left home in 1825 to find fame and fortune and honor on the European stage. Aldridge received in his lifetime honors and decorations from the crowned heads of Europe and learned in artistic societies unheard of for an actor either before or after his time. Parenthetically, that is no longer true. Olivier now is the most decorated. But until that time, the man most honored and decorated in all the world was Ira Aldridge, a black man born in New York City. It's not that Aldridge was a genius or that he was a Negro, but what happened to his memory, especially in this country, that we want to comment on. In 1858, Aldrich performed in St. Petersburg in Russia, and his performance was reviewed by no less than the great French writer and dramatic critic, Theoph Theophile Gauthier. Theophile Gauthier. Professor F.A. de Sommercrass of the French Department of Harvard University translated the entire works of Gauthier, 24 volumes, into English. But if you were to compare the original French text against the professor's translation line by line and page by page, you would find the translation beautiful enough, exact enough up to the passage on Aldrich. But then the professor makes an abrupt halt, takes a leap, and continues his translation one paragraph beyond. In all the 24 volumes, faithful to the works of Théophile Gautier. 
his mention of Ira Ulrich is left out by Professor de Silvercraft. How are we going to put it back? Black cultural center. Okay, now, on to Zorro. On to Zorro. Okay, now, this is a story in the spirit of the African stories. It is not about an animal. It is rather about a mollusk, a, not an insect. But what is a snail? Well, we don't want to embarrass any bio biology students here, so we won't even ask the questions any further. But you know, a snail is a snail is a snail, right? Okay, this is about a snail. Now, this is a story that Zora Neale Hurston collected on one of her many trips to the South. Zora was not only uh, an uh, not only a great storyteller and a writer, and he comes from the South. She was also an anthropologist and had studied under the master himself, Dr. Franz Boas at Columbia University in anthropology. Not only had she studied under Boas, not only had she mastered the disciplines of anthropology, she joined him in a mighty experiment that affected black folks in American society even to this day. How? Please, don't rush me. In the 20s, in the 20s in this country, there was a scientific law that really had us by the collar. That law was that black folks were inferior indeed, but they couldn't help it. They had little minds because they had little brains. And the littleness of their brains grew from the fact that they had smaller cranial capacity than their white brothers. And so, how could you help people who had peanut heads? <laughs> what could you do for them? Does it make sense to pass laws through Congress to give them money to build them black cultural centers? They cannot assimilate knowledge. Their heads are too small. And so great scientists went around feeling sorry for black folk because the aid was too little. Now, Professor Franz Boas had some questions about this scientific theorem, and he wondered in certain circles, uh, has anybody taken the trouble to measure some black heads as against some white heads? <laughs> when he raised the question, of course, the scientific community looked at him with scorn. Ha! How dare you? You expect us to go out and measure black heads? What do you think we are? France says, okay, I'll do it myself. And that's what France did. Now, right near to Columbia is a fantastic collection of black heads owned by black people in a black town called Harlem. <laughs> so France says, hey, look at here, I got a whole pile of evidence <laughs> right over the rail. So now, who am I going to send? He looked around in the class, and of course, there sits Zora, black, shining, beautiful. He says, Zora, step into my office. So he got Zora in the office, gave her the assignment, and told her the importance of this Zora upon the success or failure of this experiment. The future of your people undoubtedly rests. Go, Zora, measure some black heads, and God go with you. In addition to sending God with her, he gave her a giant pair of calipers. You know, the calipers that measure things, right? So Zora went down to the Harlem community and stood on the street corner with her shining calipers. And as brothers and sisters would come by, Zora would say, hey, bro, step over here a moment, please. <laughs> the brother would stop his headlong flight, you know, trying to make a dime or something, and say, yeah, yeah, what you want, honey? I'd like to measure your head. <laughs> hey, what's the matter with you? Is you, you crazy? No, 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 I'm not crazy. I have this instrument here. I want to measure your head. I said, look, chick, if you don't get out of my face with that damn whatever that thing is, I'm going to knock you on the flat on you. But Zora said, look, bro, we black together, right? And we in the same thing, and this is important. The white folks want to measure your head. I said, well, we don't want to keep the white folks waiting, do we? So the brother would be convinced, and Zora would measure the brother's head and jot the measurements in her little book. All up and down Harlem, she went with her magnificent calipers measuring the heads of black folks. And she collected data and data and data and data, piles of it. So did other researchers until finally, France boys came out with a book saying statistically, measure for measure, ain't no difference between whiteheads and blackheads as far as nothing. 
And if black folks is inferior, it ain't because the heads are small. And the scientific word had to say, well, if you're going to measure them, in that case, what are we going to say? But Zora Neale Hurston was involved in that experiment and helped out in the liberation of her people with a pair of calipers. You know, she was a great scientist. But then she went south to collect some stories. She collected songs. She collected hymns. She collected all kinds of stuff. And uh, then, mm -hmm, I'm getting close. No worries. Um, but you, I want you to, to, to hear this. This is a story she collected that has to do with a sister snail. Now, Zora tells it uh, because Zora was born in a small town in Edenville, uh, which was a black community. Her father was the mayor and wrote the laws. And every day on the town's cultural center post was a store, you know, one of the country stores. People sat out on the porch and they would tell stories. And these stories were magnificent creations. And Zora as a child would just listen and listen and remember. And this is one of the stories she heard from her forebears sitting upon the porch and has to do with uh, Sister Snail. Now, I have added something which I think Zora would permit me to do. Um, I had a lot of aunts when I was a little boy down in Cogdale, Georgia, and those aunts used to sit on the porch with my mother, and they would comb each other's hair, and they would be talking. And the ladies at that time thought it was rather stylish to dip snuff. And they would be sitting there talking to each other with their lips loaded with snuff. <laughs> now, snuff is a cultural uh, artifact you got to deal with careful like you see but you got to get your snuff and put it on your finger and you put your lips out and, mm -hmm, and you put the snuff between the lip and the gum huh? and it come out like that and then you got to tamp it in there and hold it for a while so you can get it together cause if you don't if it loose too much you liable to spit on your neighbor and neighbor don't like that none. So you got to take time and get your snuff together before you start talking and communicating. Now, I think this snail was a snuff differ. So I'm going to share that with you tonight. Now, one morning, Lige, you know, the human in this, met this snail on the far side of the road. He had passed her several times in the last three years. He had stepped over her several times in those last three years as he crossed the road. She was always forging straight ahead. But this morning, he found her clean across the road, and she seemed mighty pleased with herself. So he stopped, and he asked her where she was headed for. Going off to travel over the world, she told him, I done left my husband for good. <laughs> oh, how come, Sis Snail? He didn't ill treat you no way, did he? Can't exactly say he did, brother lie. But you take and you take just so much, and then you can't take no more. <laughs> Your claw gets full up to the neck. The man gets around too slow to suit me. And look back, I did can't break him of it, so I done left him for good. I'm out and gone. I guess I'm around right past my own self, and I just can't put up with nobody gets around as slow as he do. <laughs> oh, don't leave the man too sudden, says Snail. Maybe he might come to move around fast like you do. Why don't you sort of reason with the poor soul and let him know how you feel? I done tried that until my patience is all wore out. And this last thing he done, run my cup over. You know, I took sick in the bed, had the misery in my side so bad that I couldn't rest in the bed. He heard me groaning and asked me what was the matter. I told him how sick I was. Tell him, Lord, I'm so sick. <laughs> so he said, if you sick like that, i go get the doctor for you. And I said, I still would be mighty much obliged if he would. So he took and told me, I don't want you laying there 
and suffering like that. I go get the doctor right away. Death, damn it, go get my hat. So I laid there in the bed and waited for him to go get the doctor. Lord, I was so sick. I rolled from pillar to pole. After seven years, I heard a noise at the door. <laughs> and I said, Lord, I'm so glad. I know that my husband done come back with the doctor. <laughs> so I hollered out and asked, Honey, is that you done come back with the doctor? And he come growling at me and giving me a short answer with, don't try to rush me. I ain't gone yet. <laughs> it had taken him seven years to get his hat and get to the door. So I did up and left him. <laughs> ah, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to tell you. Uh, it's time to stop, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Just got sort of warmed up. But uh, there are certain constrictions, time being one of them. Uh, it is now 9, 12 or something like that, and I'm, I'd like to spend some time uh, on questions and answers uh, before I think there's a reception. But um, anybody who has a question, anybody has an answer, <laughs> just stand up, sing out, and let me have your question. Now, as I said before, I'm not an authority. I'm not a scholar. I'm a storyteller, and I lie a little sometimes, but only in the best of interest. I mean, I don't... <laughs> You know, and like I said, Pearly said, I never told a lie yet. I didn't intend to make it come true someday. See? So, what you have a question? Did you have a question? Somebody raise their hand. Yes, sir. Uh, the creative work of Spike Lee. Uh, you're touching several bases. You're touching Spike Lee, the producer. You're touching Spike Lee, the director. You're touching Spike Lee, the actor. You're touching Spike Lee, the, uh, what did we miss, writer? Writer. And yet, but you're also touching the area that we seldom mention, in which Spike is the true genius, the business. Uh, and not just business, business. Spike is a master mass marketeer. And that is going to be more and more important as we have a global economy and access to all the world through satellite, Spike is ready for that time. And you all better get ready too, white and black, because Spike going to be there. Now, where do I place Spike? <clears throat> I don't think Spike is the greatest writer in Hollywood. I don't think Spike is the greatest writer among black writers at all. I think Spike is young. I think he is growing and will continue to grow and will eventually become a writer of some consequence. Um, I like what he's written so far, but judged purely as a writer, I would say to him, my fellow student, go and work some more. Spike as a director is good and growing better all the time. Each film he makes is a step ahead and beyond what he made the time before. He is indeed one of the gifted directors in Hollywood. Uh, now, Spike also is one of the most easygoing directors, which means that Spike has to be a genius at casting. Because Spike's way of directing is to say, oh, there's the camera, and uh, here's you, and then there's this thing over here. Okay, uh, roll them. <laughs> and and you got to be ready with your stuff. You know, Spike is not going to give you acting classes and go too much into details. So you got to be ready. But a part of what makes a great director is the capacity to cast well. Now, Spike as a producer <clears throat> is indeed a phenomenon. Usually, independent producers produce one thing. And then if it's brilliant, they may get a chance to produce two. But man, if that two don't make it, if, if they black, 
That's the last you hear of that great producer. Spike is a producer because he is also a promoter and a mass marketeer, ties his productions to his performance in such a way that Hollywood cannot close the door in his face. By that I mean, Spike seems to know how to reach through the institutions already set up there to exclude him, the distribution network, he uses Hollywood's distribution networks, reaches through that network, put his hands on his own people and say, hey bro, I got some at the box office, come on and let's take a, a, a shot at it. And black folks listen to Spike and come to see Spike's film in such sufficient number that the box office, you know, gets pretty heavy. The box office got the mumps, like Dizzy Gillespie says. Plenty of money in that. Hollywood seeing that loves the brother. They hate him, but there's, oh God, the man has the gift for money. As long as they believe that, Spike, all he has to do is to get on the plane with his wheelbarrow, go out uh, to the studio, say, okay, fill it up. And they fill it up, say, okay, uh, don't call me, I'll, I'll call you. Uh, don't, don't, don't come to Brooklyn, because I ain't got nothing for you to do. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> then he goes, and he does his film. And he cuts his film, he edits it, he puts the music to it, does everything. He retained a very sacred and a very rare right. Steven Spielberg may have it, maybe one or two others, but Spike has final cut on his pictures. Under normal circumstances, any director who makes a film, I don't give a damn how great he is, can make it, turn it into the studio. If the boss sees it and likes it, fine. If he sees it and doesn't like it, he can call another editor and say, take it apart, put it back together. Long dust and dust line. The director can't say a word. Great director. Spike is not one of them. So Spike is an independent man who knows how to take capital from somebody else and maximize it before he sends it back, give them their cut with a little profit and keeps an equal cut for himself. He is therefore a great producer, a great genius of a uh, producer. Now Spike as an actor is very good, but then of course he's always acting Spike. So, uh, that, that both is a gift and a limitation. It's hard to judge that. Let's say that Spike is the best Spike I know. <laughs> Put it like that. Um, so I would give the man plus uh, in all those categories with the possibility of genius in mass marketing. Okay, next question. Yes. I do the epilogue to Prairie of Victorious. That's a question. I'll consider what I want to answer that uh, uh, af after a while. Okay, who, if I remember it. Uh, another question. Yes. You mentioned earlier that um, there was a break in that history. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. And we have to thoroughly understand it. If we confuse freedom and equality, we tend to blur the division between them and lose both. We have to be very clear what freedom is and what equality is. And to understand that in terms of freedom, not only are we free, but we've helped America define what freedom is, not only for black folk, but for gay folks, for women, for all other kind of people. Black folks have helped America define what freedom is. To me, freedom, and this is my definition, freedom is a right. It's a right that pertains to an individual by virtue of the fact that he or she is born into a contractual arrangement spelled out in the Constitution, 14th Amendment, all them amendments and the civil rights law, we are free. We are free to go where we want to. We're free to go into this university. That's freedom. But we would be equal if we could go across the street and build our own university. We can't do that yet. So that our freedom is limited by our lack of power, which I think needs to be addressed. Now, let us say that instead of having one more river to cross, after slavery was over, we had two rivers to cross. The river of freedom, and we've crossed it in style. And Martin was there leading us across you know, and, and, and Malcolm and all. And yet, on the night before Martin died, and you remember television reminds you of that eloquent, heart-rending, heart-breaking speech 
in Memphis that night when he said, I may not be there with you, but we're going to be free. You know, I have been to the mountain and I've seen what it is on the other side. You know, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And I can't see that without tears coming to my eyes. But do you know what the main body of that speech was that night? The main body of that speech was very simply that black folks have certain powers which they themselves need to maximize in their own interest. It had nothing to do with white folks. Uh, in, in concurrent figures, he spoke about the gross national product that black folks produced, which put them on a par in market terms with Canada. Uh, for example, today we produce, let us say, uh, in the neighborhood of $250 billion a year, which means that uh, we are one of the best trading partners that America has. Uh, Canada may be somewhere in there, but black folks are about the ninth richest uh, market in the world. And you would say, being all that rich, $250 billion in your pocket, hey, bro, what's the problem? Why can't we solve one? Oh, man, I'm just loaded with this stuff here. Uh, why can't we get there and do something? And that's a key question. The reason is because the 250 that we generate is a resource, but a resource only. And power is control over resource, not ownership. The very rich say very simply, control everything, own nothing. Well, that's something we can debate. But what we need in order to establish or to achieve equality in, in, in black America is not something that the whites can give us. It is something that we must give ourselves. We need to establish the institutions that other groups established when they first came here. A lot of people came here and got down in the ditch. The Italians, the Jews, the Hungarians, the Polish. They got in the ditch, but they didn't let their children stay in that ditch. The child went to high school and on to college. And they said, children, go to school. Mom and dad would make these pennies and these nickels, but we want y'all to show us how to spend them to help all of us. And that's what black folks need to do with our children right now. Say, we got all this money, but we don't know how to spend it. Go and teach us how to spend our money. Create for us a black middle class. That's what the black middle class is supposed to do. Create for us black entrepreneurs who will give us black banks, black financial institutions, who will take us, use, let us know, know how to take the dollar into our community and make it turn around 10 times before it comes out again, instead of turning around only once. So when we talk of equality, it has an economic frame of reference, and we have to pay attention to that. Malcolm raised, raised the question a long time ago, and he raised it in, in this way. He said, yeah, yeah, you fight, not then you dine. You know, you pick it and all that stuff and getting shot for the right to go in at the white man's counter and eat a hamburger. But you ain't considering the question of what you're going to do and get in there and ain't got the money to buy the hamburger. So we achieve the freedom to go inside and get the hamburger. Only equality, which is the management of our resources for our needs, will give us the power to stand with all the other groups at the trough underneath the belly of the great cash cow and suck our tit like they do. That's how America operates. We are not there yet. We can see it, and one day we will be able to do it. But this generation has the assignment not of achieving freedom, but of using freedom to achieve equality. Here, here, here. Next question. Yes. Before I comment on that, uh, let me reiterate one more time that
that because segregation is such a dirty word and a word that has cost us lives, I really don't want to use it. What I meant was that we used our collective strength to help each other do what we needed to do as a group. And that required us building black institutions that I mentioned. And black colleges are black institutions that help us. It doesn't mean that black colleges are against white colleges or against Catholic colleges or against Jewish colleges or against Hispanic colleges. No, no, no. America should have room for all them colleges standing side by side on an equal footing. We should be free to collect ourselves in whatever way we want. Now, the black colleges today are caught in a bind. The traditional purpose for the black college, they no longer serve or, or are allowed to serve. They do not themselves know how to shift gears and to give black students what black students need which is the knowledge of how to maximize black power. Now, the black colleges see freedom as the opportunity to go to work for IBM, to go to work for Xerox, to go to work for the big corporations, and they assiduously train our young folks to do that, and quite rightly so. And they stress these, the skills, which are marketable, and that's wonderful. They need to do that. That needs to be done there. And sometimes, because a lot of black youngsters are wounded and need special attention, the black student can study and benefit from engineering on a black campus better than that black student could on a white campus because of the nurturing he might find in the black environment. But the truth of the matter is, because the black colleges do not yet understand what their function is, the building of black institutions to serve black needs they wander, and, around, and, and they wander also because they, where is their economic underpinning? The black community does not yet see the great value and virtue of black colleges, else we would support them like we support the black church. We don't, because we don't yet understand what the fight for freedom is all about. We think we are, I mean, fight for equality is all right. We think we're already free, so we need the black college. The black colleges, therefore, need first to be understood and to understand themselves. They need to assign themselves a specific historical function, and they need to demand from black people the support that they need to get. Now, what, I, what do I mean by assign ourselves a specific function? It was on the campus of a black college, Howard University, that constitutional law and civil rights law came to perfection, in a sense. Not constitutional law, but certainly civil rights law. There are those who say civil rights law was invented on the campus of Howard University. Mordecai Johnson, first black president of Howard, looked out at the Howard University Law School. It was a night school. It was taught by two or three white professors, and people studied law at night and he went to Supreme Court Justice Brandeis and said, I really am in trouble. And Brandeis said, yeah, I know. Brandeis said, I can tell every time a brief comes before me if it's written by a black lawyer. I can tell from the grammar. I can tell from the language. I can tell from the shoddy work that went into it. If you're serious about law and civil rights, you better put a first-class law school on that campus. How he did it, he got Charles Houston, who had come from Harvard, and they began to build a law school. At that same time, the NAACP had an organization called the Legal Defense Arm, and they were trying to plot strategy to end segregation in the South, particularly in education. And the two institutions combined, Thurgood Marshall came out of that to mention only one. But they studied the law. They decided to use the law to attack the bastions of segregation. 
and they laid out a plan and they followed the plan. And one by one, they chipped away at the bastion of segregation until finally in 1954. When was it? 55, 54? In May 18, 1954, it fell. But it wasn't an adventitious fall. It wasn't accidental. It was a plan because Howard University had assigned itself the job of making the Constitution square with the rights to freedom of black folks. Now we need those universities to say, we need to do the same thing in America for, free, for equality as we did for freedom. And we do need it. How, for instance, are we to measure equality between individuals, between groups? When is a gay pride group equal to another group how does a black group profess its equality in relationship to an Italian group? How are the groups equal? We, we haven't even thought about it. We haven't begun to ask ourselves these questions. And yet, if democracy is to work, if it's, if it's to proceed, it must walk on two feet. One foot is freedom, the other foot is equality. We need from the black schools in particular that they recognize their responsibility and say we're gonna come up with a discipline come up with a curriculum and teach our children how to fight not only for freedom, but for equality. They're not doing it yet. They don't fully understand what it is, but we're stumbling toward it. It's much better than nothing, and it's gonna get better. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Uh, okay, you had two questions. One, I think, it was about complexion as a, as a tool among black folks, a political tool among themselves. Um, uh, that, to some degree, might be a fact, but it might be a prejudice in-house. I do not think that it has uh, uh, too much significance. I do not think that the light-skinned blacks have class distinctions between the dark-skinned blacks. I think America looks upon race as definitive. If you got that one drop in your brother, you know, like Malcolm said, you know, you're all in the same boat, so don't, don't worry about it. Now, but the other question, crime in our communities, where our young people are killing each other, as in Detroit, you know, or killing the old people, or wrecking their own communities, black on black crime, the greatest cause for death among young black males is homicide, mostly visited upon them by other black males. It's a crisis situation. What indeed are we to do about it? Well, I doubt if the moral approach will work now. We can't go into the communities and say, say no to guns. I don't think that's gonna work. Didn't work with say no to drugs, so it's not gonna work with say no to guns. What is called for, brothers and sisters, and this calls is, 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 a, is, is that we should bite the bullet. And we should bite the bullet from the top of the government 